right, everybody, we're going to get back into today's Cabral concept, episode 3238 of the show, where we talk about the root cause of histamine imbalances as well as mast cell activation sy- symptoms. Uh, and here's why. So there's a lot going on online with, you know, things move. They move from being, oh, it's an issue of too many omega-6s, you know, which again, there's truth to all of these things. Now there's a root cause issue of it being mold. Now there's a root cause issue of it being mercury. Now there's a root cause and now it's histamine, right? So it's like things just go in trends. And what I want to always share with people that these aren't mystery-based illnesses and also they aren't root causes in, in and of themselves, right? So when you think of um, histamine-based issues. So histamines are not something that you say, oh, wow, the root cause of my issues is histamines. Okay. The root cause of histamines is an imbalance in the degradation of histamines itself. Why are you not, your body not breaking down histamines, which are natural and your body needs it, just like inflammation. Your body needs inflammation as part of the repair based process and cleanup process, but why is there too much of it? So the same with histamines, like, okay, why aren't you breaking it down? Why aren't you using the histamine? And also what's causing you to fill up that rain barrel of more and more histamine? So when I hear like histamines are a root cause, they're not. Again, this is coming from someone with literally mastocytosis and something called mast cell activity syndrome. That is a um, conglomeration, a buildup of mast cells in your blood that are constantly degranulating all of these histamines, right? And the histamines then cause the itchy eyes, the sneezing or the congestion, they cause headaches, they cause stomach-based issues and and kind of bloating, Uh, they can cause skin rashes. So those are all common symptoms of sometimes a histamine uh, overload. And what I wanna share with you is that histamines always have an underlying root cause. They themselves are not the reason that you are feeling why you're feeling. Now, histamines are real. I really had mast cell activation syndrome. I really had mastocytosis. I really had horrible seasonal allergies. That was one of the reasons why increased why my histamines were high. And I had real food sensitivities. Another reason that increases uh, histamine levels, which we'll talk about, right? So just in those two scenarios, well, if you're sensitive to grass, mold, pollen, dust, that increases uh, histamine. So you need to lower your exposure if possible or decrease your sensitization. We could talk about that. I also had sensitivities to certain foods. Eggs were one of them, chicken was one of them, almonds were one of them, kidney beans were one of them, okay? That increased my histamine levels. I removed those for a period of time and it decreased my histamine levels, right? So like, again, so histamines weren't the root cause. They were a factor created, so they definitely caused symptoms, right? They caused my headaches, they caused my stomach, a lot of my stomach issues, they caused skin rashes, no doubt about that, okay? Caused my irritability, caused my headaches, like that, that was for sure. But the issue is uh, environmental, and food. Now, those weren't my only things. I want to talk about that. Now, here's an issue though. Some people don't produce as much diamine oxidase. Diamine oxidase is an important one to remember because that's an enzyme essentially that breaks down histamine in the body. Well, it's naturally produced in the gut. Okay. So if we think about that, you say, oh, I don't produce as much diamine oxidase. Yes. Some people don't produce as much diamine oxidase. I'm one of those people. I'll raise my hand. But also, Back in the day, I had candida overgrowth in my gut, I had SIBO, and I had H. pylori, all of which can cause leaky gut from inflammation, causing more gut-based permeability, setting off a higher immune-based reaction, and less diamine oxidase production. So now I'm creating more histamines in my body, and I'm not able to break them down as much because my gut is a mess right? So again, root cause of histamines in this particular issue, leaky gut, leaky gut. Well, what's the root cause of my leaky gut? Because it's not a root, it's not the root cause as well. Candida overgrowth, bacterial overgrowth, uh, H. pylori, my food sensitivities that I had. Now, some people also have parasites. Okay. So that's a one big one as well. We need to fix that. Now, another one is this. Histamines have to actually um, be processed intracellularly, like in the cells themselves, in the tissues of the body. And there's one more thing besides diamine oxidase, and that is called histamine N methyltransferase, also just shortened to be H uh, to be HNMT. Okay, so this then 
if we don't degrade them in the blood and we're not able to get them into the cells, they free float around in the blood to a greater degree. All right, so that's what creates this buildup of histamines and then that histamines then create the skin rashes and joint pain and stomach issues and headaches uh, and fatigue and irritability, right? So a lot of those things. Now, what does your conventional medicine doctor do? They say, well, it looks like you have IBS. It looks like you have um, urticaria from your hives. It looks like you have some, and like you have migraines. They give you some special, you know, symptoms, right? And but it's it, but then that has a symptom, and it's and or it has a factor, and it's histamines, and then histamine has its own factor. So that's what I'm trying to share here today. So what I want to talk about is the other factor is we can have gut-based issues, we can have environmental, we can have the food sensitivities, uh, but we can also be putting things into our body that's elevating the histamine levels. And unfortunately, it's a, what a lot of the health influencers have gotten into. And listen, I get it because in my 20s, I made all of the mistakes in the world as well. And sometimes, this is the thing, like, I'll always say, oh, you know what? I want to learn more about brain health. You know, like, okay, how can I learn more about brain health before talking on the subject, really, right? Oh, well, Dr. Amon's been, he, Dr. Amon, I don't know how old he is, but let's say he's in his 60s. Okay, he's been doing this now for 15, 20 years, longer than me. And although maybe we've seen the same amount of people in our practices, because we run big practices, he specializes in just the brain. And he has done 90% more patients of just the brain. Let me see what Dr. Amen has to say on Alzheimer's, on dementia, on whatever it might be on his SPECT uh, MRI-based images, et cetera, right? So like you want to learn from that. So what I want, I'm just, again, I know that uh, I don't want to be here on a pulpit thinking like I am um, anyone that has, someone has to just say, oh, well, you, you need to do it this way. I'm not saying that. Everybody's on their own path. But we have to be careful, right? So if you're a health influencer, you want to tell people that here's the journey I'm on. I'm seeing if it works for me. It may or may not be right for you. Because to tell people that they should be on a low carb, high animal protein, organ meat, egg based diet is not right for everybody, right? To tell somebody that they should be on a high fat diet is not right for everybody. To tell everybody they should be on a low fat diet or high carb is not right for everybody, right? So it's like if you have no lab tests in front of you and you've never met with the uh, individual, you have to be really careful. And you have, to be, you have to understand your position that you're essentially giving people advice. This is what I do. But like, be careful because it might not be right for them. Because one of the big things we see online right now is people eating tons of organ meat, lots of eggs every single day, lots of like fat-rich dairy-based products. And be like, well, this is how our ancestors ate. By the way, our ancestors never ate that way. But <laughs> they went through tremendous periods of no food and meager calories and were almost always hypocaloric. Right, And the people that weren't because they had a lot of money and they could afford all those things, they didn't live nearly as long as the others, believe it or not, and they had way more dis-ease in their body. They got diseases like gout and histamine-based issues, right? So it's like, it's important to look at that because our ancestors definitely weren't sitting down to raw liver every single day. Like I think we have to be like careful with saying all of these things, which are just not factually true and not healthy for the body. Because the, one of the issues is that when you look at taking in a larger amount of foods that can specifically be food sensitivities or higher in purines or can create more inflammation, and again, I'm not saying they're bad, but we have to be careful as to the recommendations we're making. Because specific foods that are high in histamines, especially if someone has some in the underlying conditions, are fermented-based foods. Remember, they get now, so we're, we're always in trends. So 15 years ago, I remember, everybody drank kombucha, and it was like the new thing, and they were eating uh, fermented veggies all the time, like a jar at a time. Okay, well, those are loaded with histamines, loaded with histamines, right? You're like, how come I get a headache every time I drink a kombucha or eat all these fermented veggies? I thought they were good for me. I thought they were prebiotics. Okay, they can be but not for everybody, right? And also the quantity matters. So fermented foods, aged cheeses, right? Oh, well, you should eat 
uh, aged Parmesan Reggiano every day. Okay, like, again, I'm a, I come from an Italian background. It's delicious. Great. Is it right for everybody? Uh, probably, I don't know, right? Aged cheese, pretty high in histamine. Doesn't mean, again, this does not mean that histamines are bad, but when you have a histamine intolerance issue, you have to be careful of taking in too much. I'm going to link up previous histamine shows that I have on all the different foods at stephencabral.com slash 3238 today. All right. And the next one is alcohol. Alcohol loaded with histamines. Um, cured meat, fish, anything like that might not be great. Again, it could be a healthy food, uh, but may not be great for you. And then others are even certain spices, right? Like cinnamon, nutmeg could be sensitivities for many, many people. Uh, and I won't even go into, I'm going to put up a whole show because I don't want to make this the show on just histamines that raise your histamine levels because some foods are histamine liberators um, and that and some foods block DAO, diamine oxidase. And so not all foods are high in histamines, but they affect current histamine levels. And some foods actually block um, diamine oxidase. So that's important to look at that. And then beyond that, it's like the season of life that you're in. Are you very stressed right now? Um, are you being exposed in this one particular season? I remember every April, end of April for me, massive allergies because that's when all the trees started to bud. So although it was beautiful in Boston, Massachusetts, I'd be walking around, I would be in agony. My eyes would be bloodshot. They would be tearing. Uh, it was awful. The, al the allergies in my eyes, especially, is what was most affected. And then for some women, I have a show um, where if they're more estrogen dominant, that estrogen, believe it or not, um, can upregulate mast cell activity, especially during the luteal phase. So all of these things are extremely important to look at, how it all functions all together, and especially those with autoimmune issues. Autoimmune can be tied to histamine issues. Just remember, histamine issues, they do have their factors in something called the deficiencies and toxicity of the body that I talk about in the rain barrel effect. There's two ways we get sick. There's two ways we get well. That's it. We have a deficiency of something like diamine oxidase, but in terms of histamines, it could also be zinc to copper. It can be magnesium or it could be B6. If you don't have enough of those or balanced levels of those, you're going to have an increase in histamine levels, right? So no doubt. So those are some deficiencies. Omega-3s is another one. Okay. Now, toxicities. We talked about environmental. Mold is another one. We talked about food sensitivities. Heavy metals, we just just touching on right now. And then other environmental would be also the stress, right? So we want to look at those as to what those factors may be. So the reason I brought you this show here today, though, is, is just simply to say that we have to be careful what we're hearing online. And also that I think as, as a health practitioner, you want to make sure that you're, you're checking yourself to say, okay, is there more I could learn in this area? Or if I'm just learning this area, amazing. Tell my people that, hey, I don't necessarily have all the answers. I'm on this journey. I'm on the journey to figure out. I'm on the journey to explore what is going on here. Here are the next steps that I'm taking. Maybe this is something that you want to look into as well. And that is an amazing thing to do. And I think probably one of the best areas. And for me, on my shows, what I try to do is just say, hey, here's some interesting, fascinating research that I'm looking into, especially on the Friday shows. And for the things that I've worked on, again, we've run over half a million labs and we've seen well over a quarter million people in our practice. So we have so much data. What I want to do is to always try to share with you. If you've been struggling a while now, there's always an underlying root cause such as histamines. I had horrible allergies and horrible histamines my entire life. I no longer have any of those issues. Now it's not magic. I was shared information from my mentor, many mentors, but one main mentor. I ran my underlying root cause labs, the at-home lab testing, I found out my deficiencies, which lo and behold was B6. I mean, that was one of the main ones, zinc and magnesium. And it made a tremendous difference. And then I found out what my toxicities were as well as massive gut issues, et cetera. Did I get, did I fix myself overnight? No, it took time, it took time. But almost everyone we see in our practice can become well in three to six months. That's what, that's what we've seen. So if people are willing to just simply do the work, change a few things here and there, modify certain things, the results are tremendous. And it leads to just such a greater quality of life. And that's what I want for everybody. So thank you, everybody. Appreciate you. Hopefully this was helpful. I'll talk to you tomorrow on The Cabral Concept. 
Thanks so much for tuning into today's show. Before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I want to make sure that you're getting our daily content, not missing out on anything. Functional medicine, wellness, weight gain, weight loss, anti-aging, living longer, stronger, and all of the most cutting edge research. And if there's any topics you want to hear, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Take care.